singing that song that I am who God says that I am. You believe that? I don't know how you walked in here this morning or how you're coming here online. Maybe you struggle to believe that. Maybe you sing it and it's just because you're going through the motions. We're gonna talk about, from Romans chapter eight, that very thing. Who does God say that you are if you're in Christ? What does that mean? What are the implications of that? I've shared this a number of times, but Romans eight, we're calling it the greatest chapter, and um, you could debate that, but it is remarkable. The Apostle Paul is among the greatest intellects that's ever lived, in my opinion. On top of that, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to write this letter which is just breathtaking theology. And I'm trying to cram into 30 minutes for you with my feeble brain what he's saying. So we're gonna trust God to do far more through his word than we could ask or imagine. Let's pray. God, we thank you that it's true that we are who you, you say that we are. And we confess to you that sometimes we believe differently. Sometimes we believe the lies of what others have told us, who our parents said we are, what the world says about us, what our own hearts deceive us with. But here in this moment, we come before you and, and acknowledge that the truest thing about us is who, what you say. So Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts and remind us, first, who you are, in light of that, who we are. We pray this in your name. Amen. When you read through the New Testament, it's amazing to look at the, 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 uh, the range of metaphors and images that are used to describe what it means to be a part of God's family, to belong to God, our relationship with God. There's lots of pictures. You'll be familiar with some of them. Throughout Old and New Testament, shepherd and sheep is a common image. It's, it's fascinating to unpack what that means. In the Old and New Testament, uh, vineyard and, uh, so the, the vine and the branches and vineyard and vine dresser, we are God's vineyard. He's tending and pruning and cultivating us to bear fruit. In the New Testament, we're, we're a holy temple, we're God's building, building blocks on, on, built on, connected to each other, interlinked, built on the foundation of Christ Jesus himself. We're also called God's body. Some of you are the big toe, others of you are the ear, some of you are the eye, the hand, like we're body parts, we need each other to function well. But two of the most profound images are familial, relational. And the Apostle Paul uses bride and groom, the church is the bride of Christ, we're wedded to him through his grace, he's claimed us as his own. But the one we're gonna look at today is that of a father who has adopted children. You're part of God's family, not because you were born into it, not because your parents were, because if you're in Christ, he has adopted you as his precious daughter or son. And what does that mean, this doctrine of adoption? Maybe among the most important things for us as followers of Jesus to understand in our lives. The family is a powerful thing. My dad was the best man in my wedding. I grew up in a wonderful family. I'm profoundly grateful to God for my family. Not a perfect family by any stretch, but I was given a great gift. Some of you share that experience. I love the family that I grew up in. So blessed. I felt the love of God through the love of my parents. If that's true for you, praise God every day for that. I know that for some of you, that's not the case. You grew up in a family where it was hard where you struggle to believe that God loves you precisely because you lack that in your home. And it becomes a barrier for you. I just want you to know that whatever the case, God sees your situation, he knows all about it, and he longs for you to know him as father. What we're gonna see in our passage from Romans 8 is that one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit is to convince you continually that you are what we just sang, a child of God. And I would suggest that what you need more than anything else is this role of the Holy Spirit in your life, regardless of your family of origin, to know deep down that you're his son, you're his daughter, and that he loves you. To guide, convince, remind, and assure us that we are indeed adopted children of God with all the rights, responsibilities, riches, and privileges that come with it. We all need this. So let's look at Romans chapter eight, 
verses 12 through 17. This is part two of a little mini-series within the series called Life in the Spirit. Last week we looked at what the Spirit does uh, specifically, and we're going to look more intentionally at the four roles of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer outlined in, in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to deeds, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. As usual, Paul packs a lot into a few sentences. Remember Romans 8, 11, uh, the verse we ended last week with, if the spirit of him who lives in you, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, lives in you, then he will also, by his spirit, give life to your mortal bodies. If the spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the grave, lives in your heart, because you've trusted in him by faith, then what? Well, this section is the then what? Specifically. The Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the grave, dwells in you, then what's he going to do? Four roles of the Holy Spirit we're going to look at. How do Spirit-filled people live? Specifically, how do Spirit-filled... And by the way, some of you might, when you hear the word Spirit-filled, you might be thinking, oh, that's the super-Christians. No, don't forget, there are no non-spiritual Christians. Everyone who has trusted in Jesus has the Spirit of God living in them. You might not be paying attention. You might, have, you, you might have conditioned yourself to stop listening to the Spirit. You might be growing in your understanding of the Spirit, but He's there, and He's working, and He's speaking. You're not without Him, ever. So, if you're in Christ, you're a spirit-filled Christian. How do we live? And specifically, what do we do with our sin? Because in Romans 7, we find out that when you come to faith in Jesus, it's not a magic bullet that takes away all your problems. It's not like you stop sinning automatically. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? We still struggle. We still wrestle. We still doubt. We still do the things we don't want to do, and we don't do the things that we want to do. So how do we, how do we deal with that? First, the role of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit empowers us to overcome sin. Think about it. If the Spirit of God really is dwelling in you, the one who raised Jesus from the dead, then there ought to be some difference in your life. There ought to be some change over time. You ought to be able to look back over your life walking with Jesus and say, this used to be my issue and it's not anymore or it's not as much anymore. In the moment, we don't always see that. It's like when you see a, a kid walking in, like when I stand, it's been two years since I've seen some of you now. We're coming back to church. I see a family I haven't seen, and their children are like a foot taller. And I feel like the old guy, oh, you're so big. You know? But I haven't been with that person every day. And so growth is imperceptible sometimes when you're right next to somebody. But when you see someone after a long time, it's, whoa, you've grown. Spiritually speaking, we don't always see the, what the Spirit is doing in us. But sometimes we need to step back and take stock and look back and say, whoa, God really has been working in my life. I see now that this used to be my issue and it's changed. The Holy Spirit empowers us to overcome sin. Let's look at verses 12 and 13 once more. So then, brothers, and by the way, Paul, when he uses brothers, he's, he's, it's, it's, not a, it's not a gender exclusive term. He's talking about brothers and sisters in the family of God. We are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Okay, that's pretty simple. That's bad, right? <laughs> flesh, death, bad. <laughs> but if by the Spirit you put to de death the deeds of the body, you will live. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit is working in our lives to help us not manage our sin. I read a book by an author who said, there's, we, to, some of us believe in the gospel of sin management. You know, rationalize your sin, keep your sin in its place. You know, you're not, nobody's perfect. You're gonna have your hangups, but just deal with it. Hide it. Keep it in check. That's not at all. The gospel does not, when the Spirit comes into your life, Jesus did not die on the cross for you to just manage your sin. He died for it. And the Spirit comes into your life to give you the power to put it to death. To end it. Now, this side of heaven, none of us will be Perfect. But that does not mean we do not have the power to overcome sin in our lives. We do. This is what he's doing in you. 
I like the phrase, that, he used the phrase debtors. What does that mean? We are not, not debtors to the flesh. Debtors means you owe. There's an obligation. I, I have something to pay. Paul is saying, you owe the flesh nothing. It's brought you nothing but misery and ultimately death. That debt has been paid. You owe nothing. So stop living like you have this debt to pay because it's been paid. You've been liberated from that and you now have a new obligation to the spirit, which is life and peace. You see how awesome that is? You're living like a debtor. You're living like you're in debt and I gotta work off this debt. And Paul's saying, no, that's paid. You owe the flesh nothing. It's taken away. You believe that? That alone, that understanding alone is liberating in the power. You don't have to give in to temptation. You don't have to remain stuck in those patterns of thought that are holding you down. You don't have to continue in this addiction. You might say, oh, I know I don't have to, but I just, no, you don't. You are free. Living according to the Spirit means putting to death our sinful desires and deeds. The Bible doesn't call you to minimize it or manage it, but to kill it. We have rabbits eating our plants in our backyard. My wife, uh, is not, she doesn't like the, the killing of all animals with the exceptions of the rabbits in our backyard. <laughs> Put to death <laughs> those rabbits who are eating my hydrangeas and tulips. And we, we have these bushes growing, and like the bottom of them is all bare because like you, you can see how tall the rabbits are because they eat right there. <laughs> my point is, right, there's something like that that's causing damage. There are things in your life that are causing damage, eating away at who God wants you to be. And the Holy Spirit's role in you is to point that out and to give you the power and the belief that you can deal with that. You can put that to death. That doesn't have to be. Isn't that good news? If that were it, that'd be good news. But there's more. But wait, there's much more. If it sounds harsh or critical to you to say, well, you know, putting to death, it's probably because we don't understand the seriousness of our sin or the power of the Spirit. There's no gospel of sin management, as I said. Let's look at Romans chapter six, verses 12 through 13. The Paul puts, Apostle Paul puts it this way. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. You don't owe it anymore. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. This is profound wisdom. Paul is saying, part of the way you overcome sin is the, part of the role of the Holy Spirit to help you overcome sin in your life is not just by pointing out all the stuff that's wrong. Bad, bad, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, right? That, that's a miserable way to live. All the bad stuff, trying to avoid it. Like walking through a minefield, trying not to step on all that. Like, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, okay, yes, this is wrong, but what then? Don't present yourself to sin, present yourself to God. There's a positive side of the role of the Holy Spirit, not just pointing out all the problems, but saying, stop this, start that. Present yourself to God as instruments of righteousness. This is, what he, this is his point. The Spirit dwells in you, then you'll want to do this. Doesn't mean you'll always do it. I talked to a man once who said to me, I, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I said, well, why do you say that? Because I would be better if I was a Christian. I would be better than I am. I was trying to help him see that that very longing in him to be better was a sign of the Holy Spirit in his life. You'll want to. Years ago, uh, when I, many years ago, when I was a college athlete, you have to take that on faith now, but <laughs> there was a day, right? <laughs> There was this longing to be better, the best I could be through training. You never quite achieve that. You want to be the best you can be. You never quite achieve it. But there's this pursuit of something. In this Christian life, too many of us, yeah, I believe in God, I, I, I'm, I've, I know that I'm saved, but it makes no tangible difference going forward. We don't grow. We stay stuck in the same patterns. What a tragedy that we don't access what's given to us. John Owen, a Puritan pastor and theologian, wrote, be killing your sin or it will be killing you. There's no middle ground. The Holy Spirit didn't come into your life to help you just keep it in place, but to put it to death. 
Second, the Holy Spirit leads us as God's children. This is the second thing we see in the text about the role of the Holy Spirit in your life is the Holy Spirit is in charge. Sometimes you wrestle for the reins or want to take the wheel back, but the, one of the marks that the Holy Spirit is in you is that there's guidance, there's leadership, there's movement. He's calling the shots, as it were. Romans 8, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit are of God are sons of God. There's a connection between who's leading and who we belong to. And by the way, you're going to see the word sons a number of times in here. This has nothing to do with gender. It's a, well, in the Old Testament, sons were the heirs and those that were to inherit the share of the family's wealth. So what Paul is saying is that in Christ, men and women, male and female, are sons, heirs. We're all sons of God. Uh, it's, it's a reference to the status and rights of sonship, as it were. Being an heir, everyone who is in Christ is given all of those rights. If the Spirit dwells in you then why are you still trying to call the shots in your life? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in your heart, why wouldn't you let him lead? Why would, I mean, that doesn't make sense. That's like, uh, for example, my son is a plumber's apprentice. He's learning the ropes of being a plumber, my youngest son. And he's learning from those licensed plumbers who are experienced. How much sense would it be if they came to your house for a job and my son, who's in two months on the job, said, I'm going to take over and, 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 and redoing re, re all your pipes? You'd be like, ah, let the one who knows, who's licensed lead and you follow. So many of us, we want to take control of our lives and we're not actually qualified for that job. You're not ready. You have one dwelling in you who is way more fit than you will ever be to lead. Let him lead. I've been trying to do this in my own life. As a pastor, we just had a retreat for our executive council and leadership team went away to pray and talk about the future of the church and how we're doing and seek God. And what my tend the temptation for me is to apply human wisdom to every issue. Well, here's what we need to do. Here's how to address that. Where, what are our opportunities and challenges and how do we bring? And there's a place for that, but it's good. And I'm learning to do this over and over again to stop and say, okay, these are all our plans, but what do you want, God? What do you want? Is this what you want? If it isn't, let us know. You should do that in your own life. You've got your plans. You're mapping out your future. It relates to your 401k or your career or your family. We all make plans and making plans is not wrong. But how often do you stop and say, God, what are you, is this what you want? Am I on the right track? What do you want? Let the spirit lead. Begin by asking the question. The Holy Spirit is referenced to us as a helper, a comforter, a teacher, a guide. You can trust him to lead your life. He's, he'll be far better at it than you have been or would be. In the specific context of Romans 8, the Spirit leads us to put to death the, the deeds of the body, sin. That's what he's leading you to do. Deal with these issues. Face them. Overcome them by letting him lead. Third, the Holy Spirit assures us that we are beloved sons and daughters of God. This is the center of the whole passage and the place I want to anchor us for a few, several minutes. It's one of the most critical roles of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. To assure you. To give you deep assurance of soul, mind, body, heart, in every way that you are a beloved daughter or son of God. It's the center of heart of what Paul is saying here. Look at verses 15 and 16. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery. A couple of things to notice here. I know I got a new board, a new toy. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. There's so much of this. If, you, if you've never memorized scripture before, this is a great place to start. This is who you are. We just sang it. I am who you say I am. I'm a child of God. 
It's the role of the Spirit to continually convince you of this. Because you forget, and you doubt, and you question it. Romans 5, 5, the Apostle Paul says, God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Why did God save you? If you think about that, for what purpose, what was the ultimate reason that God sent his son to die on a cross to pay for your sin and to redeem your life? Why? Does he need you? Is he somehow incomplete without you? No. Does he owe you something? Absolutely not. He's self-sufficient, perfect, and needs none of us and owes none of us anything. Why then? Why would he do it? What was his goal in doing it? Is it so that we would get to heaven? Well, that's part of it. Is it so that you would uh, obey him and, and, serve, and serve him? Yeah, but that's not all of it. That you'd be his witnesses. What's the reason? We get a hint of it at the end of Romans chapter eight, um, which we're, we're, we'll get to in, in several weeks, where the Apostle Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor anything else in all creation can ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. To be inseparable from the love of God. That you would forever experience the love of God as your father. And he would be glorified in that. Some of you will know the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and a catechism was a way of teaching children uh, or people, instructing people, um, particularly children, about the things of God by, by asking questions they were taught the answers to. And the very first question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism is, what is the chief end of man or humanity? Some of you know the answer? To enjoy God and glorify him forever. This is, this, this is the reason God saved you not just so he could have you a little trophy in heaven or for you to do work for him, but so that you would enjoy his love. And that would bring him glory. Do you think about that? God's whole purpose is for you to enjoy him as father. And be, he will be glorified in that. Do you? Do you enjoy him as your father? Do you spend time talking to him as your father? Do you think about how amazing it is that the God of the universe is your father, that he adopted you? chose you, calls you precious daughter, precious son. Do you enjoy that? That's what he wants. To be inseparable from the conscious, continual experience and knowledge of the love of God the Father. Someday that will be true of us when we're with him in glory, but he wants it to be true of us now. For most of us, me included, it's fleeting. It comes and goes, right? There are little moments where I'm overwhelmed by the love of God and the joy, but most of the time I kind of muddle through. I have my head down, I'm not paying attention, or I'm questioning, or I'm fearful, or I'm anxious. That's the spirit of slavery. to fall back into fear, the Apostle Paul says. Look at what he says in Galatians chapter four, verses four through seven. But when the fullness of time had come, this is the answer to the question, why? Why did God send his son? God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. You see that? He sent his son to redeem us, why? So that we might receive adoption, be children of his. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I don't think we pay enough attention to this idea, truth, profound concept of adoption in scripture. When you're justified by faith in Christ, you stand before God as judge, and he behind the bench says, not guilty because of the cross. That's good news. If you're in Christ, God, the righteous judge, can declares you not guilty because of the penalty that was paid for you by Jesus. That's the legal declaration which justifies you in God's sight. There's a legal side to adoption, right? Once it's official, and it's signed, you legally become a new child in a new family, get a new name. But there's also a relational side to adoption, isn't there? 
That's only the beginning, the legal adoption. There's the process of, of bonding and of recognizing and of believing and of living as a new, in a new family, with a new identity, with a new future. So imagine this, God the judge with the robe and the gavel steps out from behind the bench, takes off his robe, steps down and walks up to you and the judge puts his arms around you and says, my child, my daughter, my son. Both of those go together. It's not just not guilty, now see you in heaven. It's you belong to me, you're mine. Here's how John puts it in 1 John 3, verses one through two. See, the word see means behold, look, think about. What kind of love the Father has given to us? What kind of love is this? That we should be called children of God, and so we are. That's, That's a great verse. Friends, look, see, behold, what kind of love does God have? That he would call us children Sons, daughters, beloved, and that is what we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. This is so great. We're his children right now. What we will be as his children is not yet fully realized, but we're still his children right now. What kind of love is this? I want to go back to this idea of the spirit of slavery and the spirit of adoption. These are important for us to grasp. The spirit of slavery says we would fall back into fear. Meaning there's no security in your position in the family of God. You're not in the family of God. You have no position. There's no status. No rights. No future. This spirit is I always have to work to prove my worth. I'm never sure where I stand. I'm never sure if it's enough. And there's no guarantee that despite how hard I work, I'll ever be accepted. You live with that hanging over you. And some of you have been in church your whole life and you're living under the spirit of slavery. You always feel I'm not good enough. Maybe that's been ingrained in you from your family of origin. Maybe that's what your mom told you. Maybe that's what you you got from a lack of a father in your home. Maybe you believed the lies of of friends in, in this world. And you intellectually believe that God's real and loves you, but you don't, you're living under a different spirit. Paul is saying, God has given you the Holy Spirit, who in one way of knowing who he is and what he does, is the spirit of adoption. And this is the exact opposite. There's no earning. There's not fear, but confidence. Assurance. I'm going to misspell something right in this fast. There's, there's, there's no, there's a, there, you have status in the family. There's belonging. You don't have to earn anything. They're completely different. They're diametrically opposed. And here's the thing. You can't live the Christian life under the spirit of slavery. It's impossible. You can't please God, honor God, feel the love of God, or express love for God if you're living under the Spirit. This is what Paul says. God did not give us a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but the spirit of adoption, which is totally different. This is the relationship God desires for you to have with him. And I I think it's the security of this relationship that is the key to the Christian life. I think it's the joy and assurance and confidence and security that you are who he says you are that is the whole ball game. He says that 
this spirit of adoption causes us to cry out, Abba, Father. Some of you will know that Abba is an Aramaic word. It's a word of tenderness and intimacy and affection between a child to their father, like Papa. Some have said Daddy, although it's not quite the exact equivalent. But the point is, it's not a Father, it's Abba. And do you know where else this word shows up? When Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane and cries out, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. If possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Trusting himself in his agony and pain to the goodness and protection of his heavenly Father. Knowing it would mean going to the cross. We'll see an image here on the screen of the Tavanyar family. This is Mark and Renee and their newly adopted daughter, Allie. You might see them here worshiping in the front row often. The, after 1,700 plus days of foster care, the adoption was legal on May 11th, just this past week. Praise God for families who adopt children. Yeah. They chose her. They love her. They pursued her. They risked and gave up a sacrifice to have her, to make her their own. It took time. It took effort. And now it's finally legal. And now begins the process of Allie learning all of that means. All that's been given to her. Not every adopted child gets this. Sometimes they struggle. And they wonder about their family of origin. Or they wonder if it's true and if they really fit. Sometimes we struggle, even though we believe that God adopted us. We struggle to to understand all of that means. I'm gonna to read to you something sent to me by uh, an older young lady. She's a teenager. Uh, the daughter, uh, Rachel is her name, of Carrie Van Rossum. Carrie runs our, our welcome desk and, and connections here at Chapel Street Church and her beautiful adopted daughter, Rachel. I asked, what does it mean to you that you've been adopted? And here's what Rachel sent, and I have permission to read this. I've been so blessed to be part of my family and I wouldn't have it any other way. I would not be where I am today, or even be the same person without my family, which is a testament to God's perfect timing and plan for my life. He knew who I was and who I'd become, and he loved me unconditionally before I was even born. God loves us so passionately that he makes room for us at his table so we can grow in profound ways in our relationship with him, just as my parents loved me so deeply that they chose to provide for me. As an adopted child, you get this beautiful sense of belonging you know that being part of this family is where you were meant to be, no matter how your story started. I love that last line. You know that this is where you were meant to be, no matter how your story started. So let's pray that Allie grows to know exactly what Rachel wrote. And let's pray that we, as adopted sons and daughters of God, grow to know what it is that God desires for us. The cost. The deep love and desire for you to know this is where you're meant to be, regardless of how your story started. This is just a glimpse of what God wants for us to feel and experience. And I honestly, I, I really think that 90% of a pastor's work is getting people to believe that it's true. I think 90% of my job is helping people just, it's true. God loves you. The Spirit lives in you. You're, you're liberated. Live like it. When I used to coach football, I would sign the notes to the guys that I coached and write, I believe in you at the end bottom because I just I want them to believe in themselves. I want them to know that somebody believes in them. That's just a, a very imperfect reflection of what God is saying to you by the Spirit all the time. I believe in you. You're mine. John Owen, I mentioned him a moment ago, he wrote that the greatest sorrow and burden you can lay on the Father, the greatest unkindness you could do to God, what do you think it is? Disobey him? Sin? The greatest unkindness you could do to God, he says, is not to believe that he loves you. When I first read that, it stopped me in my tracks. Think about that for a minute. The worst thing you could do to God is not to believe that he loves you. The father says, I sent my son to die for you. 
and you still won't believe? The son says, I gave up my life. I went to the cross willingly. Why will you not believe? The spirit says, I reside in your heart. I speak to you all the time. I'll never leave you. I'm always at work in you. Why will you not believe? What more do you need? Some of you moms and dads know the pain of wanting your children to have the security and believe that they're loved by you and by God. For many of you today, it's time. Time to believe. It's time to believe that, you, that God loves you, sent his son for you, will give his spirit to you. Some of you, you, you believed, but you can't live the Christian life on that which you believed 20 years ago. You need to believe the gospel today, right now, every day, every moment. Lastly, the Spirit awakens us to our inheritance as heirs with Christ. Look at verse 17. And if we're children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So there's, there's more, right? The, the Spirit helps us overcome our sin, but there's more. The Spirit speaks to our, leads us and guides us, but there's more. The Spirit tells us constantly we belong to God, and if that's true, there's even more, that we're heirs, and heirs receive an inheritance. What's our inheritance? Simply put, it's God. The greatest gift God can give you is not earthly riches, it's not his promises or his gifts, it's himself. And he's already given you himself by his spirit. There's no gift God could give you apart from himself. And he's given you, imagine it's like this, God has written you into his will. I, God Almighty, being of sound mind and body, do hereby bequeath to all of my children, me. You get him. The greatest gift he can give you. We're, we're wanting God to do these paltry little things because we're so short-sighted and small-minded. And he's saying, do you have any idea what I've already given you? And it's not something you have to wait for. The Spirit of God resides in you now. In fact, this is what Paul says to us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 through 14. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. He's the guarantee of your inheritance. Revelation 21 tells us that someday we'll dwell with him, he'll be our God and we'll be his people. That's always been his plan all along. Psalm 73, my favorite psalm, at the end of the psalm, David, the psalm, Asaph, the psalmist, excuse me, says that my flesh and my heart may fail. There's nothing on earth I desire besides you. And my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion, literally meaning my inheritance forever. He's what I get. He's what I want. He's who I have and who has me. We're gonna come and finish our, our, our service at the communion table. But I, I wanna give you a moment before we do that. You hopefully have your cup. If you don't, the ushers will come and serve you. Just put your hand up and I'll make sure you have the elements. I wanna remind you of what we said at the outset, what we sang at the beginning. That the truest thing about you is not what you may have heard in a dysfunctional home growing up. It's not what you may have taken in through a culture and social media bombarding you with lies and, and myths and false truths, false promises and half-truths. It's not even what your own guilty conscience says, that if you're in Christ, meaning you have surrendered your life to him, then believe what he says. Why would you surrender your life if you're not going to believe what he says? And what he says is, I've given you my spirit. And the primary job of my spirit is to tell you over and over again, as long as you draw breath, that you're mine. That I love you. You're my son. You're my daughter. Nothing can change that. And all I have is yours, God says. 
You have so little idea of what he has in store for you, of what he's given you. I'm just gonna give you a moment. I'm not gonna say any more words and I want to let the Spirit of God speak to your heart about who you are. Before the benediction and you're dismissed, if you're here this morning and you want prayer for any reason, there are members of the prayer team that will meet with you in the glass room at the end of the service. Particularly if you're here and you're living under that spirit of slavery with fear and insecurity, and you want to know the freedom and joy of being a child of God, we'd love to pray with you. Father, thank you that you have adopted us and chosen us, not because we're worthy or special or deserving, but because you are a good and loving and gracious Father. And you've given us your spirit, who's always telling us that we belong to you. Thank you that we are no longer slaves to fear, but we are indeed your children. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And go in peace.